All right, good morning. Um, today's uh, topic, as you can see, is uh, matrix models, which is a sort of assortment of different, uh, different approaches, different types of models. And uh, the main thing that they have, uh, they have in common is that um, in most of these models, it pays to see the, see the data set as a matrix. I mean, so far, we've sort of drawn the data set as a big table. Uh, but usually when we look at the data set, we've seen it mostly as a, a set of vectors. So uh, we loop over all the instances and all the instances are vectors. Uh, but in some cases, it can be very helpful to look at your data set integrally as one big matrix and do something to that matrix. Uh, and that's sort of the unifying um, property of all the models we're going to discuss today. So here's the plan. Most of the uh, lecture will be taken up by... Um, Recommender systems, find a piece of chalk, which is a slight deviation uh, from the basic recipe. And the most popular way of doing recommender systems, of, of implementing recommender systems, is through matrix factorization. So look at that in depth. And then after the break, we will revisit principal component analysis, which, we, as we will see, can be seen as a kind of uh, a matrix model as well. And then very briefly, we will look into graph models. which can be seen as a kind of generalization of this uh, recommender system idea. And then we'll close up with some important but brief notes about validation. Because as we saw with the sequences um, lecture last, uh, last time, last Monday, if we deviate from the basic model, basic recipe of machine learning, we should also uh, reevaluate how we evaluate and how we validate our, our model. Uh, so make sure we're not making any mistakes there. Uh, so that's what we'll end on. But first, uh, matrix factorization, I'll follow in my exposition, I'll roughly follow the uh, outline of this article. So if this is relevant to your project or to a future project, and you think this might be interesting, but I didn't quite get all the details, then have a look at this paper. It's very, uh, very good introduction to the subject. Um, and what it describes is the winning model, or the model that ended up winning the Netflix competition. Recommender systems as a field basically got started when Netflix, who were then a DVD rental company, not a streaming company, they had a sort of service where you could, uh, through the internet, order DVD rentals, they would be mailed to you, and then you could mail them back after you'd watched them. Um, and they... Um, their business model required a good recommender system. So what they did is they published a huge amount of data of uh, users and user ratings. So users' movies and users rating those movies. Uh, they said, well, um, our score is a root mean squared error of about one. And the first model that can beat that by 10% will get a million dollars. So this was sort of the first really big data science competition. This was four years before Kaggle. Uh, and they sort of started uh, two things, the idea of data science competitions and the idea of recommender systems as a, a proper big field. Um, so let's look at that task. Given some users, given some movies, uh, and given some ratings, let's uh, see if we can recommend users new movies that we think they'd like. Uh, and we'll start by looking what data we have available, what information do we have to, to uh, make our judgment. Um, I'm guessing most of you know Netflix, and you, so you know that they collect explicit ratings. We call, we call that explicit feedback. So you just ask a user for a given movie, what do you think of this movie? And current day Netflix uses a thumbs up, thumbs down button. But other things are possible. They used to do a five, uh, five star rating. Um, other uh, platforms do just a like, 
uh, like uh, Facebook and Twitter. So lots of different rating systems are possible. But uh, you explicitly ask the user to rate a specific pair of a, a movie and a user, a specific user to, ask to rate a specific movie. So that's called explicit feedback, uh, which is very valuable but relatively rare. You can't ask a user to rate all the movies in your database. So you can extend that with implicit feedback, where you sort of uh, look at what the user is doing, you spy on the user, and you look at their page views, you look at um, things they've added to something like a wish, wish list or a watch list, uh, which most platforms have. And you can even go as far as embedding a little JavaScript in the browser that records their mouse movements, so that even if they don't click on a movie, but their mouse cursor hovers over the movie, you can still infer, possibly, that they, uh, they might have clicked the movie. Uh, if that seems far-fetched, some websites actually do do this, so um, you are being watched. Um, so that's implicit feedback. It's not as valuable because it doesn't mean 100% if, if a user clicks on a movie, it doesn't mean 100% that they liked it, but maybe averaged over all the extra data you get, it can still be helpful. And then there's side information, which is not information about the pairing between users and movies, but information about the uh, users themselves and information about the movies themselves. So we have uh, things like length, genre, actors, directors, synopsis, awards about the movies and about the users, of course, we have lots and lots of information as well, where they come from, uh, what their computer system look like, looks like, what they look like, stuff like that. Um, and this can also help you to improve these sparse classifications. Like if you know from explicit feedback that somebody likes one Steven Spielberg movie, and you know that this other movie that they haven't rated is also directed by Steven Spielberg, you can, in principle, conclude that they might like that movie as well. Uh, or if two users are from the Netherlands and one likes, the, one likes this Dutch movie and the other person is also from the Netherlands, then maybe that person would like the movie as well. So you can sort of help uh, use the side information to um, infer similarities between movies, infer similarities between users, and hopefully use that as, uh, as a way to cluster your um, data as well uh, and, and enrich this explicit feedback. So those are the three forms of data we have. Explicit feedback, implicit feedback, and side information. Uh, and most of the lecture is, is phrased in terms of this movie recommendation uh, thing. But um, it's Recommendation is another abstract task, which is useful for lots of different, uh, lots of different settings. Probably the first company to really make use of this in a big way and really sort of base their whole website navigation on recommendation was Amazon. I think they were much earlier than Netflix with this kind of stuff. Um, so here you have, instead of users and movies, you have users and products. You're recommending a user a product that they might like to buy. And instead of explicit feedback, you have purchasing history. So based on what you've purchased before, we try and predict what you've purchased, what you're likely to purchase again. Um, you can recommend users news stories or uh, things to read. So based on what you've read before, combined with based on what you liked before, if there's a like system, I don't think Google News has a like system. Uh, so Google News probably just looks at what you've read before. And then tries and recommend you tries to recommend you uh, new things to read. And of course, the social networks are also f um, filled with recommendation systems. So uh, I'm not on Facebook myself, but I know that Twitter recommends you other people to follow. It adds recommended content, like uh, other tweets that you might like but you're not subscribed to. It adds them to your timeline. Uh, YouTube, of course, has a very very hyperactive recommendation system. Uh, if you watch one video about a subject, immediately your homepage is filled with uh, videos about that subject. Um, so these days, these big websites, basically their main uh, paradigm for navigation is recommendation. To such an extent that there's nowadays quite a lot of uh, news and quite a lot of think pieces about the effect that recommendation is having on uh, not just our lives, but our society. Things like filter bubbles, um, 
fake news, I mean, fake, the, the problem with fake news is partially that it's influencing our society, but also that these recommender systems are vulnerable to these kinds of attacks. So you can fool the recommender system into spreading around your content to specific people. Uh, and because these recommender systems are now so embedded in the lower levels of our society, essentially, it, it's how we get our news and how we get our media, um, that if that's it, that part of our society becomes vulnerable, our society as a whole becomes vulnerable. So this subject sort of going from a, a, a slightly obscure user interaction paradigm has suddenly now become world news and then uh, quite a crucial part of our society. Uh, so that's very interesting. So let's see how they work. Um, oh yeah, well you can extend this even further. Basically, any situation where you have two big sets of things and a relation between those two things, you uh, can consider recommendation as a paradigm. So for instance, if you have lots of recipes and lots of ingredients, and a has ingredient property between them, so this recipe has this ingredient, you could actually apply a recommender system to that and see if a particular uh, pasta dish might be uh, enhanced by adding some basil, for instance. Uh, politicians voting for laws, for instance, you can do political analysis using a recommender system. Uh, and of course, between people, between one, per uh, one person and another person, so they don't have to be different sets of things, it can also be the same set. Uh, you can recommend all sorts of uh, social interactions based on what kind of social interactions you've seen before. Um, so we'll stick with um, users and movies for the rest of this lecture make it a bit concrete, but you can basically, instead of users and instead of movies, add any of these other uh, use cases. So here's the abstract task, just to reiterate, so we've got many users and many movies, we are given information in the form of explicit ratings, implicit ratings, and site information. These are incomplete because we don't know for every user and every movie what they would, uh, how they would rate it. Uh, and that's what we want to complete, uh, what, what we want to predict. We want to complete this data set of incomplete explicit ratings. We want to predict how any user would rate any particular item M, and we want to minimize the loss with respect to the true rating. So to start with, we'll just look at uh, explicit information, and then later we'll see how to extend this with... Uh, Implicit information. So for now, we'll just look at ratings. And we'll just look at ratings uh, to begin with that are binary. So let's say we only have a single like button. And we can make a big matrix of users versus movies, where the matrix is zero every, almost everywhere, except where a particular user has explicitly said that they like this movie. And then we make the, ra uh, the matrix one, or black in this case. So this is our data set. If we look, just look at the explicit feedback, this is our data set of ratings, which we'll call R. And this is sort of what our problem looks like. And now we have this big set of users and this big set of movies about which we don't know anything. We don't know what the movie's about. We don't know who's starring in it, what the genre is. We, all we know is what particular users have said about it, and vice versa. So we don't know anything about the users in the movies. We just have this big set of um, atomic objects, which might remind you of something we encountered in the last lecture, when we talked about embedding models, uh, specifically embedding models for words in that case, where we also had this big bag of words that were all atomic, uh, atomic objects, so we know when two words are the same and we know when two words are different, that's all we know. We have only an identity relation over the words. Uh, and what we did then is we created an embedding model by assigning each word a vector and then learning the values of those vectors based on a particular loss function. In this case, uh, in order to, uh, this case we were trying to predict the uh, context of the word from the word itself. Uh, but we're basically going to follow the same approach here. So for both the users 
and the movies. We will simply assign each user a vector and we will assign each movie a vector. And we will stick them together in a big matrix. Each vector will have an embedding dimension k, which we, is a hyperparameter. We just choose, set it to 128 or something. And this will be our representations for the users in the movies. And in training our model, uh, these are basically the parameters of our model. So we train the values of all these vectors. And from those values, we then get the predictions. We do that as follows. Given a particular uh, user i and a movie j, we simply take their embedding vectors and we take their dot product. And that will be our prediction. So it'll be a value between, let's say, minus infinity and positive infinity. And the higher that value is, we'll say the more likely the user is to like that movie. Um, why the dot product? Well, imagine for a very uh, simple example, in fact, a slightly shallow and sexist example, imagine that your user has two properties, how male they are and how female they are, and your movie has two properties, how much it's an action movie and how much it's a romantic movie. And imagine that we live in a world where all women like exclusively romantic movies and all men like exclusively action movies. Uh, like I say, it's a slightly shallow view of the world, but uh, that's actually kind of a point I'm trying to make in that these models, they'd learn a quite shallow view of the world. So if you look at what they actually learn, it's this kind of thing. And if, only, if this only holds for 60% of women and 60% of men, it's still a predictive value, so they still learn it. So in that sense, you shouldn't actually expect your models to be that very uh, deep and refined. But if we have this, and if we have a particular model where these categories, uh, I flipped it around so I matched the female with the action. So it's the wrong way around. But if we have a model where these categories match, then they reinforce each other in the dot product, and the dot product becomes high. And if you have a, 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 a pair, a user movie pair, where these categories don't match, then they cancel each other out, and the dot product becomes low. So the whole point is that if you do this with a dot product and you get some vectors, and again, these are just learned values, um, then you can interpret it in this way. The kth property in the user is how much the user values that property. And the kth property in the movie is how much the movie has that property. And now from the ratings, if we, uh, we can optimize this. Uh, oh yeah, and we've slightly uh, moved the goalpost here. So now we have ratings with negative values and positive values. The dot product can also be negative and positive. So we'll assume for now that the ratings are also somewhere, uh, they've been normalized or they, they've been scaled so that they fall between negative infinity and positive infinity. And the higher the rating, the more likely that user is to uh, like that movie. Um, so, so far we haven't done very much matrix modeling yet, but what you see if is, is if you take a movie, a user and a movie, and you take their dot product, if you do this for all users and for all movies, you're essentially taking this user embedding matrix and multiplying it with the movie embedding matrix to get a matrix of all your predictions. So the prediction for user i and movie j ends up here at cell ij in your big matrix. So essentially that's our model. We have these embedding matrices containing an embedding vector for every movie, containing an embedding vector for every user. And we do the multiplication utm like this, which gives us a big matrix. And that matrix should be as close as possible to our rating matrix. Or, to put it another way, we are decomposing, we are factoring our matrix into two smaller matrices, one embedding the users, one embedding the movies, in such a way that when we multiply them back, we should get as close as possible to our original matrix. That's why it's called matrix factorization. We are factoring the matrix into the product of these two things, these two factors. 
So how do we find this? How do we find these uh, U and M matrices? Basically, we want to choose U and M so that UTM is as close as possible to R. That's the basic optimization problem, uh, which we can uh, define with the squared error. Sort of standard way of doing it. So this is a matrix norm called the Frobenius norm, which sounds very fancy, but it isn't. It's just uh, equivalent to flattening the matrix into a vector and taking the vector norm. So it's just the, uh, exactly the equivalent of the, the normal norm that we have. And we take the square of that because the vector norm has this square root inside of it that we want to get rid of because it doesn't matter for the uh, optimization. So we take a square here to get rid of that uh, square root inside the norm. And then it basically looks like this. So we sum over all elements i, j of our rating matrix. We subtract from that element our prediction for i, j. We square it, and we sum over the whole matrix, and that's our loss function that we're trying to minimize. We're trying to choose u and m so that we minimize this stuff. So it's just a basic squared error objective that we uh, know and love already. Uh, and of course, prediction ij is just the dot product of embedding vector ui and embedding vector mj. So here's the matrix view, and here's the vector view. Uh, one problem is that we often have a lot of missing values in R. Remember, if we have a matrix like this, uh, some values we know, some values are likes, uh, some values might be dislikes. If we have a, if we have two buttons, but most of the values will actually be missing values. Almost all of the ratings we don't know. I mean, if we had a complete matrix, we wouldn't need a recommender system. Um, so it's really, uh, I mean, usually you fill that in with zero or something, but really it's better to uh, not optimize over those values, values for which you don't know. So uh, the alternative that is often used is, is uh, this form, where you, instead of optimizing, uh, instead of computing your loss over all elements of R, you compute the loss only over those elements of R for which the rating is known, that are in your training set, basically. Uh, so that's moving away from the matrix factorization uh, view a little bit, but um, basically it's, it's, it's both are possible, and this is also, in some cases, this is a better way of doing it. So now how do we solve this problem? How do we take this loss? We have a loss function now. How do we optimize it? Uh, obviously, we can do gradient descent, which we'll look at in a bit. But there is also a, a more slightly more direct way of doing this if you're doing plain matrix factorization. Um, the problem itself is not convex, so it's a difficult problem. But it's biconvex, by which I mean that if you know one of these matrices, if you know M, then it becomes a, a, a not just a convex problem, but a problem with a closed form solution. So if you know M, then computing U is very easy. And if you know U, then computing M is very easy. So we can try this... Uh, trick that we've seen before of alternating optimization, we've seen this in k-means and we've seen this in the EM algorithm, where we just start with a random u and m, we fix m and then compute the new u, the optimal u for that m, and fix u and compute the optimal m for that u. And that's called alternating least squares because you're computing a least squares solution for uh, one matrix given the other. Uh, so it's a common way of doing this, but probably these days it's more popular to use gradient descent because it's more flexible and it's easier to add stuff to your model and to, uh, to treat it a little bit more like a sort of neural network. Uh, so let's see how that works if you derive the uh, uh, gradient for this um, loss function. And let's see what that says about our model updates. Let's see what that says about how we update this model. So we'll uh, take the gradient of the loss with respect to one of these user um, parameters, specifically for user L, we will have a look at feature K. I call it feature K, I mean obviously these are not explicit features, these are learned features. Um, 
but let's call it a feature just to give it a name. Uh, so of this big matrix U, uh, we're looking at this element, KL. So we fill in the loss function. And uh, I've given the difference between the rating matrix and the prediction matrix. I've given that the name E for error, uh, just to make the math a little easier. So what we do is we sum over either over all elements of E or over just a known element of E. We sum the square of this error. Uh, and then we take the derivative of that with respect to this UKL. So I've worked the, the derivative into the sum already. I've also added the one half in front of the uh, loss function because that sometimes helps us with the differentiation. And we can scale the loss function by any value, so that doesn't matter, right? Uh, so we apply the chain rule. So we get the derivative of the square of E over E times the derivative of E over UKL. So this becomes 2 times EIJ, and this becomes the derivative of the error over the parameter. Uh, we can cancel out the 1 half against the 2, and fill in the definition of E. So here we get the ratings minus this dot product, and I've written out the dot product using this um, invent nota notation that we saw earlier. So this U dot I is the ith column of uh, u, and m dot j is the jth column of m. Um, this uh, rating matrix, our target values, doesn't depend on the parameter, so we can remove that. We can work the minus out of the sum and out in front. So what we're looking at is just a dot product of this uh, user embedding and the movie embedding, which is a sum, and that sum uh, in that sum, only one term depends on this thing we're taking the derivative over, and that's the uh, part of the sum where j... Oh, in fact, we have two sums. All right. So we have a sum here, and only in that sum, only the terms where j is equal to... Uh, is equal... No, sorry, let me do it inside out. So this dot product is a sum. Only one sum of uh, only one term of which depends on UKL, namely the part where uh, J is equal to K. Did I get that right? No, uh, only the part where uh, yeah the um, sorry. Only the part where we get UKL times MKJ. That's one term that uh, depends on this uh, thing we're taking the derivative over. So then the uh, UKL and the UKL here cancel out and you end up with an MKJ. And we get this value here as our gradient. Which is a dot product here, like this. It's the dot product between the uh, column between the row mk, uh, the kth row of the m uh, of the movie embeddings and the uh, lth row of the error uh, matrix which makes our gradient update rule look like this. So we update the value UKL with eta times this, because uh, we normally subtract, so this minus becomes a plus. So what we're actually doing when we update our uh, parameters is we compute the error. It's a big error matrix. And we take all the errors over user i, it's a big long vector. And we take all the values of movie of uh, over all movies of feature k, and we take the dot product of these, and that becomes an addition to our uh, to our parameter for the user. So what that means is if this um, let's say the rating 
was very high and the prediction was lower than that. So then the error is positive, because the error is the rating minus the prediction. So we have a positive error. And we multiply that by the movie. Let's say the movie also had a high feature value for this gate feature. Uh, so then we get big positive times big positive. So a positive value then is added to this feature k for user L. Whether if there, whereas if we have a um, low rating but a high prediction, then the error is negative. And if the movie then had a high feature value, we subtract a lot from the uh, feature k for user L. So that's sort of the logic that we're doing here. And of course, if you do the same thing for the movies, uh, everything flips around. So to update feature k for movie i, we take these two vectors and we take their dot product and we add that to the feature. Uh, so that's sort of the logic that this dot product prediction uh, uh, function, score function, gives you. And then you can just train this by, uh, by gradient uh, descent. And this is um, in many ways preferable to this uh, alternating optimization, alternating least squares, because it's more flexible. You can extend your score function more easily. All you need to do is work out the gradient. Uh, it's, e it's a little easier to implement. Uh, and it tends to scale better if this rating matrix gets incredibly big. It tends to scale a little, a little better. So I think most recommender systems these days use uh, stochastic gradient descent. Uh, then you might run into the problem, for instance, if you have a single like button, that all your ratings are positive. So all your ratings are either unknown or positive. And if you, up, uh, if you optimize only for the known values, it becomes very easy to find a good uh, solution, which is just to predict a high value for every rating. If you have only the positive, if you have only likes, you can just predict a like for everything, and then you fit the uh, training data perfectly. Because basically what you're missing is the dislikes. You don't use, have, haven't told you what they dislike or what they're ambivalent about. Uh, so there are two solutions to that kind of problem. You can uh, assume that these likes are a kind of uh, sample from a probability distribution. So you can model the whole thing as a probability matrix, which user movie pairs are most likely to generate a like, as it were, uh, and then just optim um, optimize the maximum likelihood objective. Uh, but that can be expensive, that requires lots of normalization. So something else that you see a lot in, in many of these embedding models is uh, something called negative sampling where you basically, instead of actually gathering dislikes, actually gathering negative uh, information from your users, you just sample random user movie pairs and you assume that randomly sampled user movie pairs, you can assume that they dislike it or that they're ambivalent about it. Because we assume that the uh, this sort of uh, sub-matrix of, of likes, of the, the things, the pairs, of users and movies uh, that generate a like, we assume that they're rare compared to the whole population of pairs. So that if we sample a random one with overwhelming probability, we will sample uh, a, a disliked movie or an ambivalent uh, relationship. So we can actually train with random samples as negative samples. And then usually you generate a couple more negative samples than positive ones. So for every positive one, you generate R negative samples. You can set R as a hyperparameter. So it's called negative sampling, and it, it, you see this a lot in these um, embedding models. It's also used in word to vec in some settings. So that's one way to solve this. Uh, two ways to solve this non-negative uh, matrix factorization problem. And then what you get once you've done your matrix factorization, a little bit like PCA, you actually get dimensions often that you can interpret. You get something like a latent space for your movies. So here's uh, from the paper that I showed earlier. The first two vectors from a matrix decomposition of the Netflix price data. So these are the first two features that I called it earlier in the um, movie embedding. Uh, 
and you can see a sort of layout that makes uh, makes some sense. So over here are sort of the fret fret humor. I think they call it in the caption, fraternity humor. So sort of gross out comedy and stuff like that. Uh, Half baked is a stoner movie, I think. And then, as we go to the top, it, uh, the the movies get sort of more worthy and more arty. First quirky, funny art house movies, and then proper worthy uh, classics. And then along the bottom, um, there are, I think they classify this part as movie starring strong female leads. And then you get Armageddon, The Longest Yard, sort of um, less arty, uh, but more serious movies, I guess. So everything sort of clusters in a way that makes, uh, makes some sense. And the nice thing is that, that we don't, that this is done entirely on data that tells us nothing about the movies, nothing about what happens in the movies, who made them, who's in it, what the story is like. All we know about the movies is which users like them, and all we know about the users is which movies they like, liked. And we can still get this sort of semantic uh, decomposition. Um, so that was step one. That was just using the explicit information. Now we have to extend this with implicit information and control for uh, certain things. So we'll quickly run through five uh, ways of, of extending this principle to make it better, to make it work a little bit better. Um, first thing is that you, both users and movies uh, are biased. They're biased in the sense that some, movie, uh, some users are very positive. Uh, so this is the um, histogram of the users over this original five-point scale that Netflix used in this, uh, the time that this data set was generated. So you can see most users on average give about a 3.5. Uh, some users always give five ratings, not quite understanding the point that, uh, not quite understanding that that defeats the point. And some users are very negative, giving only two, uh, giving on average only two stars. So it helps to control for this. If you know this about a user, you can sort of build this into your model, and instead of predicting the absolute rating, then you're just predicting how far they deviate from their average rating, uh, which is much, uh, much less work. And then you have the same thing for movies. Some movies everybody likes, and some movies almost nobody likes. So you can do the same thing. You can have a bias for movies as well. So you work that into the model uh, in a pretty straightforward way. We have a generic data set bias, so the sort of average over all ratings, uh, over all users in movies. We have a per user bias and a per movie bias. And these are all learnable parameters that we just add to the predictions, and that's it. So it's still a linear model because we've just added some uh, vectors here, uh, scalars in this case, but so the user bias over all users is a big vector, and the, user, the movie bias over all movies is a big vector. We just add that to our prediction. And then we have the, the probably the most famous problem in recommender systems, which is the cold start problem, cold start problem, which happens when you um, get new users or new movies. So somebody joins Netflix, which means Netflix has a new user in their database for which they now, for who they now have to predict movies. Uh, but they don't have any existing ratings, so they don't have an embedding for that user. So they can't do this dot product. Um, and the same for when they add a new movie. You need some ratings to get this kind of matrix factorization going. Uh, so that's where we can use this, uh, these other sources of information. We can use it. Implicit likes, so browsing behavior and stuff like that, um, like movies watched, movies browsed, uh, movies liked by similar users, hovered over with the mouse, stuff like that. Uh, we don't define here, so you have to come up with some way to define that when a user implicitly likes a movie, and you just gather up that set. We call that NI. All the movies that are implicitly liked by user I, we call NI. And um, what we then do is we create a second user embedding based on the implicit likes, so that's called u imp i, the embedding for user i based on the implicit likes. And we create a second set of movie embeddings called x, 
And these are the movie embeddings that give us, that somehow capture the information relevant to implicit likes. And what we do then is this uh, U we created by summing over all the X embeddings of the movies that the user has implicitly liked. And we add that to their existing embedding. And then we take the dot product and add the biases as before. So that's a way of adding implicit information. We've also got side information. This is a little bit more difficult. You have to sort of figure out exactly how to use different kinds of side information. But for now, let's treat it the same way that we did the implicit likes. So we get some user features. And let's say we somehow encode the features into a kind of categorical data so that if a user has a feature, in the same way that if a user liked a movie, uh, we say that it, uh, a user has a feature and we can sort of sum over all the features that a user has, because then we can assign every feature an embedding. Uh, we call that Y, so all number of features. Uh, every single feature, as it were, we give an embedding. Uh, so a feature here is just the one item in a big set of things that can apply to a user. We sum over all these uh, feature embeddings for the particular user. So we sum over all the features that apply to this user. And that becomes our third embedding vector for the side information. And again, we add that to the existing embeddings. So now our user embedding is the existing user embedding plus the implicit information plus the side information. We add it to this uh, prediction. So now we've included all the different sorts of information as well. Now there's one more thing to say about recommendation systems. Uh, one more thing to take into account, which is that time can play an important part. These are plots from the Netflix data. Uh, so here we see the mean score versus the time in the data set. So just the... the I think the data set was gathered over about three years. So these, this horizontal axis is those three years. And what you see here is a big jump. Uh, and it, that's a point where Netflix changed their interface. And they changed the way they asked the rating question. Um, I don't remember what the specific questions are, but if you know anything about surveying users and surveying people or, or uh, writing... Uh, Writing surveys, survey questions, you know that the way you phrase a question has a big impact on the result. And here what you see is that because they changed the phrasing of the question, the average rating jumped up a lot. So if you want good predictions, you need to control for this. Likewise, there's a, a similar uh, relation that you get if you plot the movie, the age of the movie when the movie was released against the score, and you see that older movies tend to get lower scores. Um, not sure exactly what the effect is here, uh, but I guess new movies are more likely to be seen as positive. I'm not sure why. Um, but this is the effect you see. So we need to, uh, if, if we want to really predict well, we need to control for time as well. Basically, the way you do this, that is by making both your ratings, your user embeddings, and your bi movie and uh, user biases a function of time, uh, which looks very impressive if I write it like a function like this. But basically, what you usually do is you just chunk your data set, you chunk your embeddings into a number of discrete time periods, like three different time periods, and then for every time period, you learn a different embedding. So these are matrices of the same size as before, but we just have fewer ratings in the rating matrix. Uh, and that gives you different embeddings over time, and then you can control for these uh, temporal effects. That's recommenders, systems, matrix factorization. So just a short summary, when your task consists of one large set of things and another large set of things, and you have a relation between these two, then you can consider matrix factorization to model that relation. And you have 
biases, regularizers, implicit like side, oh, I skipped the regularizers, but biases, implicit like side information, and temporal dynamics to uh, take into account. Uh, here are the results from the paper. So plane gets you this kind of uh, squared error. Adding the biases drops it a little bit. Implicit feedback drops it a lot. And temporal dynamics, different kinds of temporal dynamics really help you to get into this uh, prize-winning area that you need here to win the million dollars from the Netflix prize, uh, which I think they won shortly after the paper was published, but it, by that time it was sort of clear that they were going to win it. Uh, so that's matrix uh, factorization. Let's take a 15-minute break, and then we'll continue with principal components analysis. Okay, second half. So we've done um, recommender systems. And we've seen the power of this matrix factorization. If you factor a matrix into two low rank matrix, uh, two smaller matrices, you can often uh, uh, learn to predict the missing values of that matrix very well. So let's see what happens if we now return to our classic machine learning setting. And what happens if we apply matrix factorization there? So we have a matrix again, but now we just have this plain, very classical setting of features on the columns and instances on the rows. And every instance is like a row vector in this matrix. What happens if we take a matrix like this? Uh, and, uh, oh yeah, we, we have to assume for the rest of the story to work that the uh, matrix is mean normalized. So let's say we have uh, standardized numeric data, then we know the mean is normalized. Uh, Otherwise, we don't have to assume anything. What happens if we factor this as well, just like we factor the rating matrix? So we just take uh, design a, a feature embedding C and an instance embedding WI, and we do this matrix factorization thing. We train with backpropagation or with uh, alternating least squares or something. Then what we should get eventually is uh, an embedding for our instance, which is kind of a low-dimensional representation of that instance from which we multiply it by C. We can recover the original instance with uh, hopefully a low mean squared error. And that should remind us of uh, dimensionality reductions we've done already, things like principal component analysis. Also because I should have spoiled it, but uh, Basically, this looks a lot like principal component analysis. We're looking for, we're generating low dimensional representations of our data that we can, uh, from which we can get our original data by multiplying by this, uh, applying this linear transformation, multiplying by the C vector, uh, C matrix. Um, so it looks like PCA, but it isn't PCA. So can we make it PCA? Yes. We can do if we, make the assumption that the columns of C are linearly independent. So if you take the dot product of two different columns of C, you get a zero. And if you take the dot product of a column of C with itself, you get a one. That means that if you multiply them, if you multiply C by C, the result is the identity matrix, matrix of all zeros with ones on the diagonal. So if that's true, then we know that the matrix inverse of C is equal to its transpose. So we can do this. We can do this the algebraic trick of just moving C to the other side. So we can redefine W in terms of C. So basically we can get rid of W. Because we've assumed this uh, linear independence, we can just assume that W is equal to XC. And now our model is parameterized only by C, because W follows as a result of C. And then our minimization objective, this uh, squared error over W and C becomes just choose C such that X minus X times C times CT is as small as possible. And this is exactly equivalent to doing PCA. Minimizing this function is exactly equivalent to principal component analysis. So it's a minimization under constraint, so it's a constraint minimization problem uh, because we have to make sure that this C is uh, linearly independent. And this, as I say, is exactly equivalent to uh, PCA, 
where this particular column, uh, wherever the, the kth column of uh, C, so the row of CT, gives you a mixture over the features. So it says to get one value of C, you mix these, uh, you mix the features with these values, and that's your kth principal component. So if you do this with one, then you get one principal component that gives you the best one-dimensional reconstruction of your uh, one-dimensional representation of your data. So you might say, well, interesting, but what does that bias? Well, the nice thing is that we can now look at this as a matrix factorization problem and take either this uh, optimization function or this optimization function to extend the idea of PCA to other forms of PCA. For instance, we can do PCA on incomplete data where we maximize the reconstruction only over the known values of our data. So if we have uh, missing data, instead of imputing that data or reconstructing that data, we can just do PCA on it and get a low-dimensional reprodu complete reproduction, uh, sorry, com complete representation or an embedding in modern terms of that data and then do our classification on that or our regression on that. So it's a kind of dimensionality reduction and data completion in one. Uh, apparently, and I'm at the limits of my practical knowledge of, of PCA here, but apparently this is a much trickier problem than complete PCA, so I'm not sure if this if it would work in such a simple way, but um, if you do it, it's a very powerful way of dealing with missing data, right? Uh, you can add some regularizers so that the values of your embeddings don't go too big, don't get too big. I skipped the regularizers in the matrix factorization, but you can add them there as well. Basically, you just take the norm of all your embedding vectors of W and of C, and you sum up their uh, L2 norms, and then the values of these embedding vectors won't get too big, which helps you to, to constrain the problem. But more interesting is if you... Oh, I screwed up here. So these twos here and here should be ones then you get an L1 regularizer. Um, and an L1 regularizer, like we know, is uh, sparsity enforcing. So it will set, it will ensure that as much as possible values in these embedding vectors are set to zero. So whenever these uh, embedding values, values in the embedding vectors become small, they just become zero, which makes your embeddings more interpretable. Uh, so it's difficult to see here. I didn't make this picture. So here we have PCA, and here we have sparse PCA, so PCA with an L1 regularizer. Uh, what you see is that this separates the clusters into different directions, and these directions are fairly arbitrary. So it separates it into long extended clusters, but they point in various directions, whereas here they actually point, in, uh, point along the axis. It's a little bit more spread out, so the actual reconstruction is a little bit worse for sparse PCA, but this makes the, the uh, parameters more interpretable, so that can be very useful. And then you can do other things, things we've been doing already to, to various uh, loss values, like, um, for instance, if we have binary data, so values that are 0 or 1, we can actually apply the logistic function to our uh, uh, reconstructed matrix and then apply a binary cross entropy instead of a mean squared error loss because now we phrase it as a plain old, recon uh, a plain old um, optimization problem so we can swap out this L2 loss for a binary cross entropy loss and in some cases you get a much better embedding so here's logistic PCA in this picture is very clear versus classic PCA, and you get a much nicer separation of these classes. Uh, so all that is just to say, PCA is just a form of um, a form of, of, of matrix model, a form of matrix factorization. And if we view it like that, it gives us some insights and uh, allows us to, to come up with some new, uh, new ways of doing PCA that can be very useful. And finally, our final subject, uh, graphs, graph models. Oh, no, not our final subject, our second to last subject. 
graph models. Uh, so graphs are a very useful form of data. They're a very flexible way of storing data. Uh, for instance, you can store social graphs, so you get people, and then if they're friends, there's a link between them, or if they follow each other on social media, there's a link between them. Uh, protein interactions, so the, then the nodes in your graph are uh, proteins that might occur in a cell, and there's a link between them if they interact in some way. Traffic networks, so just uh, places you can go and whether or not you can move between them, like a, a, a road network where the links are roads, or a public transport network where the links are public transport connections, stuff like that. Knowledge graphs, as some of you may have done, taken semantic web courses. Um, so these are very extended graphs where you get a heterogeneous set of nodes different nodes representing different things. So for instance, there's a node representing Peter Bloom. There's a node representing Free University. There might be a link between them that says Peter Bloom works at Free University. Uh, and you can encode all the facts you know in a knowledge graph in that way. So just to say, graphs are very versatile and you encode, can encode lots of information very naturally in graphs. So wouldn't it be nice if we had machine learning models that can also consume graphs? That's sort of the, the thinking, and that's, uh, this is a very active topic of uh, research at the moment. Uh, and of course, this is very similar to recommendation. Like if these are people and if these are friendship links, then, oh yeah, sorry. Uh, so we're looking at two tasks here. I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, link prediction, predict whether, so assume the graph is incomplete and predict whether there should be a link between two things in the complete graph, and that's basically the same as recommendation, right? So if these are people, these are friendship links, we sort of assume that we have part of the friendship links and we're predicting the rest of the friendship links. So we're really just doing recommendation again, but this graph perspective can help us look at it in a slightly different way. So if we phrase it like a recommendation problem, uh, and we just learn some node embedding for the nodes, and uh, we multiply, we uh, uh, try and figure out a way to decompose the adjacency matrix into the product of node embeddings, of these, uh, the same node embeddings on both sides. So then you have link prediction. Uh, there's also node classification, where you have separately to the graph, for every node you are given a label, <clears throat> like ham or spam or uh, a loan default or uh, stuff like that, just a classic prediction task. But instead of getting features, you get a graph over your instances, possibly together with features. <clears throat> so here's, it's, here it's a slightly different problem uh, from recommendation, but if we can work out a node embedding, then we basically work it into a, a classic... Uh, classification problem, where we have a table, we have features, we have instances, we have labels for every instance, and then we can just run a classifier on top of that. <coughs> so now the question is, for a classification problem, how would you work out these embeddings? Um, so there's one, there's really only one graph model that I uh, wanted to talk about, which is called the Graph Convolutional Neural Network. Well, one graph model beyond this, because this, oh, if we do recommendation like this, we get some node embeddings, and we basically have a graph model already. Um, but it would be quite nice if we can sort of use this graph structure a little bit more. So if you do this, you're just looking one step into the graph. You're really only looking at, at, at links at, at neighboring nodes, and not very much deeper than that. So it would be nice to look a little bit deeper into the graph and for uh, the representation of this node to look at more than just its direct neighbors and actually look multiple steps into the graph. And in order to do that, uh, the way uh, graph convolutional neural networks work is they start with a basic embedding and then they mix that embedding. So let's say we start with a, um, uh, an embedding of... Uh, 
k equals 3. So we uh, assign a three-dimensional embedding to every node in the graph. And let's say we just assign a random embedding for now. Then we can interpret that as a color just to plot it. So we just take the first, we call uh, the red value, the second we call the green value, the third we call the blue value. So assigning an embedding is just assigning every node a random color, just for visualization purposes. Um, and the intuition behind graph convolutions is that they mix these embeddings. So one step of graph convolution, uh, you recolor every node by mixing the color of all of its neighbors and the color of the node itself and taking the average. And then you get a slightly more homogeneous graph where if a node has, uh, here every node has uh, the same color, so you can't really tell, oh, sorry, every node is a different color, so you can really only tell if nodes are the same or not, if they have the same color, and if they have a different color, they are different. Whereas here, you've slightly mixed it, so you can sort of see that if a node has lots of purple neighbors, then it will get a similar color to another node that has lots of purple neighbors. Or if a node has lots of green neighbors, it will get a similar color to another node that has lots of green neighbors. So you're sort of pulling the information from the neighbors into the node itself. So from, uh, after one of these mixes, you can look at the node embedding and glean not just, what, not just information about the node itself, but also information about the node neighborhood. And then if you do this again and again and again, you can prove that eventually all nodes will get the same color, which will probably be a kind of dull gray color. Uh, so what you have here is a kind of generalization hierarchy again, right? Here, every rep node representation is sort of unique. Every node representation just represents the node itself, just information about the node, no information about the graph neighborhood. Here, it's a mix of information about the node itself and the information about the graph neighborhood. And here, every node has the same representation, which just represents the graph. So that's sort of the basic principle that we're going to work into a, a trainable graph model. Uh, first, how do we mix these node embeddings? Well, if you look at a graph, if you make uh, plot its adjacency matrix, so the adjacency matrix has the nodes on the columns and the nodes, the nodes on the columns and the nodes on the rows, and has a one for every pair of nodes that is connected. So if you plot the adjacency matrix and you make the diagonal one as well, so you essentially enforce that every node has a self loop, then multiplying the node embeddings by the adjacency matrix will give you the sum. Uh, will give you a new embedding for a node, which is the sum of the embeddings of itself and all of its neighbors. So if we multiply the original embeddings by the adjacency matrix, we get new embeddings, where every, every node embedding is the sum of its neighbors, <coughs> plus itself, because we've added this, uh, we've added this identity, uh, we've made the diagonal one as well, we've added self loops. Um, so that's sort of like mixing. Except if we want the average of all the neighbors and itself instead of the sum of all the neighbors of itself, then we need to normalize. We need to make sure that this doesn't get bigger and bigger and bigger. If we do this multiple times, we need to, after we do this, we need to normalize again. Uh, so there's two ways to do this. You can just take this matrix and row normalize it, which is popular with uh, directed graphs. Uh, and you can do something called symmetric normalization where you take the uh, uh, square root of the diagonal, I think, sorry, the square root of the, well, I can't remember exactly how it works, but uh, you sort of put a square root on either side, which is called symmetric normalization. So you, uh, if you do that, you're not necessarily averaging the, um, the values of the, the neighbors, but you get slightly more interesting dynamics. Uh, we won't go into that here, but these are basically two ways of normalizing it to ensure that your new embeddings are a mixture of the old embeddings based on the graph neighborhood, but the values don't blow up. So the values stay uh, in the same scale. 
And now we want to add some weights. We want to do this mixing, but we also want to control it a little bit. So we start with some node embeddings, N0, which are also trainable. We compute new embeddings for each node as the average of its neighbor's embeddings and its own by multiplying by this normalized JCC matrix. And now A is the normalized JCC matrix, matrix plus the diagonal. And the result of that, we multiply by a weight matrix. So this weight matrix looks at this new embeddings and sort of projects it into a different space, maybe reduces the dimension and reduces the importance of different features. And then we add an activation. So after that, we can add a sigmoid activation to scale everything back to zero and one, to between zero and one. And then we get our new embeddings. And that's, in simple terms, skipping some of the more uh, difficult math, that's your basic graph convolution. And you can think of that as one layer in your neural network. So you can do multiple layers. So we take this N1, the result of that we pass through another graph convolution, and the result of that we take as our output. So after, and then the more layers of this we do, the more deeply we look into the graph for our uh, new embeddings, for our new representations. So after k layers, the embedding mixes information from k hops away from the original node. So the more layers you add, the more you're mixing from further away into the graph. So let's look at how, uh, how you would use this for uh, node classification first. So we start with a uh, simple graph. We, give an uh, we, we, we assign an embedding to every node in that graph. And we apply one convolution to create a new embedding based on the neighbors. So these three guys here go into the convolution making, through this mixing, making up this embedding here. And the same for all the other uh, four. It gives us a new set of embeddings. And then when we map to the outputs, we do another convolution, but we set this weight matrix so that it projects it down to two dimensions, assuming we have two classes. Uh, I forgot to change spam to negative here. Let's say we have two classes, positive and negative, positive and negative. So we project down to a two-dimensional embedding vector. And if we then apply a softmax activation over that embedding vector, we basically can interpret the result of that as our, class, as our node classifications which we can then compare to our target values and then backpropagate the loss. So if we do this, if we compute this convolution in a system like TensorFlow or PyTorch, we just uh, implement this, this function. It's really not much more difficult than this. A bunch of matrices and you multiply them by each other. You compare to the target values Uh, you can then backpropagate the loss because TensorFlow and uh, PyTorch underwater, they maintain this computation graph. So you can just apply backpropagation on this, uh, the difference between these values and these values. And in that process, you can update the weights of this convolution layer, the weights of this convolution layer, and the weights of your original embedding. So that's how you do node classification with graph convolutions. You can also do link prediction. Uh, where you basically have simplified the visual notation here a little bit, but you basically basically start with these node embeddings, you apply a convolution, get some new node embeddings, you apply another convolution, get some new node embeddings, then you put the node embeddings to the left and on top of your uh, prediction matrix, so essentially you take these node embeddings and you multiply the node embeddings with the transposed node, node embeddings, and the result of that is your prediction. You compare that to your target ratings, or you compare that to your target links that you know exist. And again, you backpropagate the error. So here we have a matrix factorization model on top of embeddings that were produced by a neural network. So using this, um, these gradients that we worked out earlier, we can backpropagate through the original graph convolutions. And we can do link prediction based on deeper structure, deeper graph structure in our, let's say, social graph, for instance. Uh, this is fairly recent work. I think this is probably the real, the sort of 
breakthrough GCN paper is probably about three years old. So we're at the, the cutting edge here, uh, which means there's a lot of problems that are not quite solved. So depth is a big problem. Um, because if you, um, as you most of you will know, uh, things like social graphs have uh, what's called a small world property. So if you look at Facebook and you look at how many steps, if I go through friendship links, how many steps uh, do I have to take at maximum to connect any two people in Facebook, the number is less than five. So usually any two people here I can connect on Facebook with at least four steps, probably a lot less. But I can also connect you to anybody in Nigeria or Nepal, also within four steps on Facebook. Which means that if you start mixing on a social graph like that, uh, even if you just do four of these graph convolution steps, you're already representing the whole graph. Your node representation already represents the whole graph instead of graph neighborhood. Um, so there's a kind of diffusion of information. You, you're connecting so much information from so many, you're collecting so much information from so many people uh, that it all piles up and there's too much to know. We, this is a similar problem to what we had with the, uh, the recurrent neural networks pre-LSTM, that if you try and remember everything that happened in a sequence before the current point, you don't have enough memory left to remember the important stuff. So you need to be more selective. In order to remember stuff that happened long ago, you need to forget all the stuff that happened in between now and then. And that's sort of the same problem here. In order to get information from far away in the graph, you need to forget a lot of information and you need to ignore a lot of your neighbors so that you can get to that point. Uh, that doesn't work with plain GCNs. There's a promising uh, model called graph attention that might have this property. It's not quite clear yet. Um, second problem is that you usually have to train full batch. So we have this nice picture here. Oh, sorry. So this is a single computation graph over your whole data set. So your whole graph here goes in, you build up a gigantic computation graph using very big matrices, and you backpropagate on all of your training labels all the way down to your weights. Uh, so that's called full batch training, training on all your uh, labels at once, um, which has some drawbacks. You don't get this nice mini batch sort of uh, the, you don't get the, the stochasticity that that mini batch training or stochastic gradient descent uh, gives you. But unfortunately, there's not really a way to cut up your graph into sub subsamples or uh, subsets like you can cut up a big table of instances into subsets. Um, there are some proposals, there are some methods available, but they do reduce performance a little bit. So if you if it fits into memory, use usually people train on full batch. Uh, yeah, and this is sort of the point I made already, pooling is not selective. So all neighbors are mixed equally. Uh, and the weight, we do have a big weight matrix, but the weight matrix only controls how we project the embeddings to a different space. It doesn't control which neighbors we're interested in, which neighbors we're not interested in. Uh, and ideally, we would like our weights to do that. So this is sort of active, uh, active uh, area of research. So that's what we call the graph convolutions. Uh, they're powerful if you can fit them to your data, but uh, it is a bit of a challenge due to these problems. Uh, so finally, let's end on a methodological note for all of these uh, methods together, namely validation. So like with the sequences, we've deviated from the standard way of doing things, from the standard, the basic recipe of machine learning. So we need to see if our validation approach of splitting things into a test set and a training set still holds, because as we saw with the sequences, we need to add some, some logic to that. We need to reconsider it. And we have kind of the same problem here. So we're back to this matrix factorization, back to the recommendation system. Let's say we want to validate this, so we do matrix factorization in some way. Um, our first approach might be to say, well, we'll withhold some users. Some of our users we hold back. We don't look at during training. And then after training, we'll look at those users and see how the model does. Uh, the problem is that doesn't work. Because if we make this our training set of users and this our test set of users, we train embeddings for these users so as to complete this matrix here very accurately. We then look at one of our users in our test set. 
we don't have an embedding for it, for him or her. So we can't complete this part of the matrix because we need embeddings here. Same as if uh, same would happen if we withhold some movies. We wouldn't have embeddings for the movies we withheld, so we wouldn't be able to produce ratings for them. So basic train and test validation in that sense doesn't work here because we have this kind of mixed feature approach, right? The features of our users are their ratings over all movies, and the features of the movies are the ratings on all users. So we can't really uh, remove either of them from the data set. So what we need to do instead is something called transductive learning. And what we've been doing some, so far is something called inductive learning. Um, so if we look at the classic setting, we have a data set of features and instances, and we have a, a, column of, a, a column vector of labels. What we've been doing so far, it's called inductive learning, is just drawing a line and say some instances we don't look at until, we, until we're done training, right? And we don't look at their labels either. And the inside of transductive learning is that theoretically you could only withhold the labels on your training set. You could theoretically give your uh, training algorithm access to the whole set of features and say this, these guys are the ones we are going to ask for labels for later, but withhold those labels. But only those labels, but not the features. That's called transductive learning. And the idea, it's sort of a, a very, it, originally it was a very obscure idea of, uh, obs obscure thought about a way you could sort of slightly improve classical machine learning by giving it a little bit more information about the, uh, about the data distribution. Theoretically, if you do this in the classical setting, uh, in this setting, you should be able to do a little bit better because you have a little bit more information about your data distribution. But like I say, it was kind of an obscure idea. It wasn't really picked up because it doesn't really matter that much. Um, but now that we have these embedding models, the difference has become, active, uh, become important again because transductive learning is the only way to train on these uh, kinds of models because we have to know beforehand what all of our objects are. If we train an embedding model, we have to know all of the objects beforehand during training because we can only make predictions for things that we have an embedding over. So in order to VEC, we need to know the whole vocabulary, we need to know all the words before we train the uh, embeddings. And in recommendations, we need to know all the users and all the movies. And in graph models, we need to know the whole graph uh, bef uh, before we start training. Otherwise, it just doesn't work. And there are some, it's ongoing research whether you can do, whether you can build inductive graph models so you only see part of the graph during training. That's active research. I won't go into that. So what do we do? We do still need a test and training split. We can't evaluate on our training data. Uh, what we do is we withhold random ratings in the case of matrix factorization. So these are, the colored bits are all the ratings that we know. And we split the ratings that we know into a train, validation, and test set. And we withhold at random some of the ratings. And the rest we can use for training. In a graph, if we do link prediction, same thing, just drawn as a graph, we withhold at random some of the links. So the blue links here are the training, uh, are the test set. We withhold those. And on the rest, we're allowed to train, and then we predict, and then we test how well do we do at predicting which of the blue links did we predict well. No classification. Basically, we provide the algorithm with the whole graph. And separate to that, we make a table where we link every node ID to a label. Shuffle that. And then on this table, we make a training and uh, test and validation split. So this part, of the this part of this table is withheld. This part is given, and the whole graph is given. That's the way we do validation on uh, node classification. Um, we talked a little bit in the, before the lecture about 
matrix factorization with the time dimension, so modeling time as well as ratings. Um, in that case, we have this problem and the problem we saw in the last lecture. So we have timestamp data and we have uh, uh, transductive learning. So we need to take both things into account. So no training data from the future, that's the rule. Uh, ratings and notes can have timestamps, so if we want to do this properly, then our test set should be in the future of the training set, or let's put it here better. All training data should become should come before all validation data, and all training and validation data should become should come before all test data. This is the same logic we saw in the last lecture. Um, so that's something to consider when making these kinds of splits or these kinds of splits. If your ratings, your notes, or your links are timestamped. Final slide, summary for the whole lecture. We talked about the abstract task of recommendation and how we can solve it using matrix factorization methods. If you have, I'll say it again, if you have two large sets of objects with one relation between them, consider matrix factorization. Uh, it's also a rec uh, helpful perspective to analyze things like principal component analysis. And then there's graph models, which are a kind of generalization of recommendation, where you actually look deeper into this graph structure that your data has, and we do so using graph convolutions. So we're a little early today. That's all I had. Uh, yeah, uh, that's all I had. So next Monday, we will talk about reinforcement learning, and that will be the last week of the course. <laughs>